Task TV has reached around 2 million uh, viewers. And today we have a great program with Congressman Steve Chabot, 1st District, Ohio, Republican. Congressman Chabot, thank, uh, well, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Task TV. Thank you. I was looking forward to this and uh, thank you for inviting me. This is a, a, we are, we thank you. This is very special for our community. We want to always hear from members of Congress, both, you know, federal government, state government, and local. Uh, the Turkish American community is relatively new to America. Uh, they came in the 1950s and 60s as they were exported, uh, exported from Turkey to the United States, imported engineers and uh, physicians. Then in the late 90s and through the beginning of the new century, more small business persons and, and uh, small business owners and um, uh, what would you call skilled labor came to uh, the United States. So we have with, between the Turkish and Azerbaijani communities about 1 million. We also, of, of course, have a huge healthy Ahuska Turkish American community, such as in Ohio, in Dayton. Uh, we have a Tatar, again, another Turkic community. Uh, and of course, the Uyghurs of uh, uh, Eastern uh, Turkestan, uh, Western part of China. And, um, and we're learning how, a lot about the American democratic system, the process. And I think the best way to start learning for many of us is by speaking to legislators such as yourself. So we have a series of questions provided to us by our viewers. And, uh, and I can start if you'd like. Sure, go right ahead. I'm all, uh, be happy to answer any questions I can. I'll do the, be the best I'm able. Right on. Well, you're very special to us. Uh, also, I'm from Virginia. You're, you studied in Virginia, and now I'm living in Maryland. You went to William & Mary. I went to Washington and Lee. Yeah. Uh, great schools uh, with a huge uh, heritage. Um, the first question we have is, tell us about how you became interested uh, in and when you became interested in becoming a member of Congress? Well, it started all the way back when I was in high school. So I was probably uh, 17 years old. I ran for student council at my local high school and I won. Um, and so served there. And then I went away to college and Watergate was going on. And I had voted for Richard Nixon when I turned 18. Um, and, uh, and then of course, Nixon got in trouble. And, uh, and he, uh, Basically, what happened, he was a Republican, and uh, some people from his campaign broke in the other campaign's headquarters in the middle of the night, uh, the Democratic headquarters, and they were going to put uh, phone taps on their phone so they could listen in on what was going on, which was stupid because Nixon was way ahead and didn't, didn't need to do anything like that, uh, but they did. Now, Nixon had no idea that these rogue elements were going to do that, um, uh, so he wasn't at fault for that, but then later on, he participated in the cover-up of this. And uh, so that's what got him. And so he was going to be impeached and removed from office. Uh, so, you know, he left office, uh, uh, resigned from office. The only American president ever to do that. Well, why am I bringing this up? Well, um, I was a college student back in those days, and we were all watching uh, television about what was going on. And most of my age group, the people were turned off by politics. They thought, why would anybody want to go into politics? They're all a bunch of crooks. And, uh, but I had just the opposite feeling. I thought we needed people in politics who were honest and just wanted to serve their community and serve the country. So I thought, I think I'm going to try to do that someday. So I went to law school after graduating from William and Mary, because a lot of people in politics have a legal background. And so that's what I did. And then the year I got out of law school, I ran for Cincinnati city council as an independent, uh, meaning I wasn't with the Republican party. I wasn't with the Democrats and I lost. So, uh, so then I, I had to pick a party, and I felt my philosophy was more in tune with the Republican philosophy. So I ran again as a Republican, and this time I lost again. So I've run twice. I've lost both times, and I thought, you know, I'm going to try one more time. And I finally won the third time, served on Cincinnati City Council for five years. Uh, then I was moved over to the Hamilton County Commission for five years, and then I got elected to Congress back in 1994, um, there were 73 Republicans who ran that year and won, uh, and we took over the House for the first time uh, in 40 years, Republicans did, and I was about 40 years at the time, so my whole life, the Democrats had been in control. So it was a great time to run and, and, and win, and of those 73 Republicans, there's only two of us left in the House of Representatives out of 73, um, and 
one of the other, the other person, Mac Thornberry, who's the head of the Armed Services Committee, he announced uh, last year that he's not running for re-election. So if I win re-election, I'll be the sole uh, member from the uh, class of 94 of the House of Representatives. Oh, you're diehard. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Yeah. That's so, right. Um, well, tell us about a normal day of the member of con Congress, your day. Yeah, you spend a lot of time in meetings. Now, right now, I'm in my campaign headquarters uh, back here in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is, you know, my district. I have most of the city of Cincinnati and then the area around it. And one of the counties called Warren County, which is pretty Republican. Uh, uh, and since I'm a Republican, that's helpful. Now, the city of Cincinnati itself tends to be more Democratic. So I have challenging races. Uh, so I'm, I'm working. I was preparing for my debates. I've got four debates coming up. The first one's tomorrow night. And so I was uh, preparing for that earlier uh, today. Um, but if I were in Washington, I'd be focused much more on not just getting reelected. I'd be focused on my job. And we have a lot of meetings all day long. I meet with people like Lydia, who may bring the uh, Turkish ambassador to my office or other people who are visiting from Turkey or other countries around the globe because I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee. and I'm the uh, the uh, co-chairman of the uh, uh, Turkey caucus in, in Congress. So that's why, uh, you know, I care so much about Turkey. That's my responsibility, my position. And our alliance is, is one of our most critical, uh, particularly in that part of the world, but really over the whole globe, Turkey is a very important ally of ours. Well, we're going to get to that. Uh, we are, our, our uh, viewers are interested. What's your favorite part of the job and what's your least favorite part of the job? Uh, I'd say my favorite part of the job is actually meeting with school groups. I'm a former school teacher, and I take uh, school groups come up from back, back here since they go to Washington, usually on a bus, and I give them a tour of the Capitol building. I show them, you know, the paintings and the Declaration of Independence painting and all that kind of stuff and kind of give them some of the behind the scenes stuff. So having been a teacher myself, I really enjoy uh, trying to let other young people understand uh, why Washington is important to their lives and what we do in Congress can be important. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good, you know, so, but I want them to understand all that. That's one of my favorite parts. The thing I least uh, like is the, in the campaigns nowadays, there's nothing but negative TV commercials, uh, you know, saying how bad you are, uh, twisting things around, uh, just a lot of negativity. That's the thing that I uh, like the least. Right. Yeah, we would all kind of agree with that, sir. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, we are the voters, we are the viewers, we are the persons coming to the members of Congress for representative democracy. And, and we just needed a, all that communication to be at a much more positive, productive level. I agree. Uh, so how can people be more effective in getting their message to Congress? Uh, we have so much technology today. We have mass emailings, mass phone calling. Uh, we have personal letter writing. We have personal emails being sent. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, media out outreach. Uh, and of course, district and Hill meetings by uh, constituents. Uh, what would, could you say to our community? Our community is a little bit more, um, you know, uh, integrating with America, mm -hmm. we're new, uh, but we want to be more productive, more uh, active in American democracy. Yeah, well, it, I think it's good to have kind of a strong advocate uh, who knows how the system works and work with that person. I know I've worked with Lydia Borland for many years now, um, and she knows Turkey issues inside and out, and I, I rely upon her, I trust her, um, and so it's good to have a person uh, like that who kind of knows how the system works to help you through it. Um, now, and, and it's always good to, uh, to actually see if you can get an appointment uh, either with the congressman or congresswoman or their staff. A lot of members of Congress uh, don't meet with constituents uh, or advocates of different issues very much. They leave most of that up to their staff. Um, I think it's our responsibility to meet with as many uh, people as possible. So I try to take most of the meetings myself. Now, once in a while, um, I have other things at the same time, and it just can't be arranged. But in general, I would urge people to try to personally meet uh, with the member of Congress who represents them, if at all possible. So face-to-face, -face, showing, putting a face to the, to the words. 
That's yeah. that's the best. Now, of course, with COVID, that's much harder to do nowadays. Just like we're doing this virtual, right. Uh, right. you know, gathering today. Uh, this is like the next best thing you can do. Yep. But I'm hoping that this isn't a, isn't a permanent situation in our country or across the globe that sometime in the near future, we'll actually be able to meet in person again. Well, in the Turkish American community, we have a lot of members who are not uh, actually Turkish. Like Lydia's Italian American spent a great deal of her life in Turkey. Uh, and it reminds me when I started the Turkish Students Union in college, um, I think I was the only Turk in my college. And I started with four Italians. So they made me president, but my vice president was Benvenuto, for example. <laughs> So yeah. it was great. I think that's a reflection of how wonderful America is in its solidarity and diversity and how that diversity can express itself productively. Um, and and um, one thing we want to know in our communities, what makes a group effective and what are common errors made by groups when advocating their position? Well, I mean, it is important to kind of get your message and your strategy uh, figured out up front, you know, know who's going to do what talking and make what points. Usually members of Congress, when they meet with the group, let's say there's, let's say there's uh, four people uh, there um, and each one wants to speak. Um, figure out ahead of time what each one's going to say and kind of time it and practice it, um, even write it down. Um, and if you got four people, sometimes the meetings are going to be, you know, 15 minutes. Sometimes they're going to be a half hour. Uh, figure out how much time you're going to get from the congressman. Um, and then make sure the first person doesn't take up all the time. And that's one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen people make. Uh, the first person maybe likes to hear themselves talk or something, and they'll go on for almost all the meeting and nobody else gets a word in edgewise. So whatever those other important issues uh, were kind of go unaddressed. So that would be the thing that I see happen, uh, you know, where people go off the rails uh, probably the most. Um. Well, what democratic institutions would you say that do we have that can defend a position or defend a group that is less organized, let's say, less effective, less funded, um, but they have something very important to say, and that message has to be heard by the member and the member's colleagues? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a matter. There's all kinds of ways to, you know, getting the information. You can start out by sending talking points, sending the background material to the staffer up front. What the staffers oftentimes do, um, they'll put together a report, you know, maybe a one page or two page report for the member of Congress to read. So he or she doesn't have to go through all the materials. Now, if I have the time, I like to go through all the materials, you know, ahead of time. So it's kind of the common sense things, um, you know, and not everybody does these things the same way. But if you want to get your message across to your members of Congress, I would organize it, plan it ahead of time. You could even go through together with a, you know, a practice run on, on things. You know, that's, that's done sometimes, too. Yeah. Well, under freedom of speech, in general, we have a lot of good things. But we also have a lot of misreporting, exaggeration, or I would say even false reports. And um, do members have access to information that they can use to ascertain whether the information they're given, uh, written or through media, is accurate? Uh, yeah. What comes to mind is like the intelligence uh, community. Yeah, yeah. We, I, I go down to something called the SCIF periodically. I was down there last week to review things, classified secret information, you know, about a particular country or a particular situation. We always have to leave our iPads and our cameras outside because we don't want China or some other entity who isn't particularly friendly to us to be able to pick up. You know, China may have made that cell phone. There may be some device in there uh, for them to pick up some of our secrets. So we don't want that to that that to happen. Um, so you know, you try to take all the precautions. Um, you know, to make sure uh, that that uh, your meeting isn't going to be. Uh, overheard by some nefarious uh, uh, actors of, of some sort. Um, and, and we, you know, we have a congressional research service that we can utilize. Uh, my staff does research for me uh, before groups come in. They usually put together a memo on each group that's, that's coming in. So I have pretty good information idea about their, their background. 
Um, but you can also get CRS, that's the Congressional Research Service. They are a part of the Library of Congress, which is just across the street from the Capitol and just across the street from our office buildings. Um, and they will put together uh, reports for us about things that might be, um, you know, pretty complicated. You know, maybe Nagorda Karabakh or something like that. If you were a new member of Congress and you didn't know too much about that, and they sounded like, uh, you know, interesting words, but you don't even know where it's at or what it's got to do with, you can have the Congressional Research Service do a report for you there to better prepare you. That's perfect. Uh, CR CRC and. Uh ECR, excuse me, and uh, intelligence information you obtain, um, everyone else on the, on the Hill can obtain too uh, before they uh, speak, uh, before they write, uh, they can get their facts straight. They're, they're, yeah. So they do have that. Uh, yes. They do have that opportunity. Uh, yes. The Turkish American community, I would say, and I, I'm a second generation Turkish American, we love Turkey, the motherland. And we are passionate about the homeland, America. And uh, we firmly believe that America's best partner in the region is Turkey. And it's based on certain criteria, uh, such as uh, a large population, a young population, 82 million, a secular democracy, strong, diverse economy, second largest military in NATO, a massive human humanitarian capacity. At this time, Turkey is hosting more than 4 million refugees for example, and proportionally speaking to its population, that is a huge undertaking. Um, and of course, being unmatched in its geostrategic location, uh, what can Turkish Americans do to make what we think the, of these as self-evident truths uh, to be uh, better understood and appreciated on the Hill despite negative uh, lobbying? Uh, we would, would you say that the legislature can do a disservice to itself if it doesn't fully understand the full uh, potential and full value uh, that the Turkish people bring to the U.S.-Turkish partnership. Yes, I, I do think that, uh, that that occurs. I think we ought to get all the information. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I would strongly urge uh, members of the Turkish community to go to their member of Congress who actually they can vote for, they can vote against. And those are usually the most influential people, the people that we as politicians listen to much more. You know, if I know the person came from my district and came up to Washington and discuss it, something, maybe it's one person out of a group of five, that, that's okay too. But oftentimes I have groups come in and maybe there's one person from Ohio and everybody else is from New York. Well, it might be interesting, and I like to be educated about issues I may not be particularly familiar with, but there's nobody from my district, so, you know, they can't vote for me or against me. And I'm just telling you, the instincts of a politician are you don't pay quite as much attention. So what my recommendation would be is when you're going in, setting up a meeting, uh, do your best to try to find somebody who actually lives in that district who could vote up or down for the member of Congress. That's something that gets our attention. Yeah. Uh, well, Ohio has a strong Turkish American and a Huska Turkish American group. The Huskas are refugees from Russia uh, that the United States has accepted uh, in various parts of America, including Ohio, for example, and Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, definitely, the Turkish American community will be in your district visiting you, constituents included. Um, we have a growing Turkish American community, as I stated, and one thing that's really caught our attention as a Turkish American community is the Pledge of Allegiance. And I kind of keep these, uh, this discussion uh, simple, almost like a, a civics course in high school uh, for my community, but when we particularly like the part that says, uh, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all, and we wish this also for, for the, the motherland, the people of Turkey. Um, yep. What would you recommend our young people who are interested in uh, civic engagement and uh, government do? And more importantly, because we have a culture that's based on great respect to our elders, yep. uh, what would you recommend to their parents? Well, be, be respectful um, and, you know, you know, you, you can't necessarily, you're not always going to convince other people that you're right or they're wrong and that shouldn't be your goal, but to try to, you know, be friendly with people and, 
try to give them the facts and be aware of what those facts are um, and just treat people, you know, with respect. That would be my best advice for parents to uh, talk to their, their children. And, and I, I totally agree with you on that, on what you mentioned about, uh, you know, one nation under God. Um, you know, you have some people in this country that want to remove God from politics or from government altogether. Um, and uh, that's not what our founders ever anticipated or ever wanted. Um, they were not trying to say that uh, religion can't be involved in government. What they were saying is that uh, you can't have a national religion. You can't have a uh, one say that, well, we're all going to be Catholic in this country or we're all going to be, um, you know, uh, Lutheran or we're all going to be, uh, you know, Jewish or whatever. You, you that's not what it's all about. Our founders weren't for that. What they wanted to make sure uh, is that everybody could practice their religion as they so uh, wanted to do. But we wouldn't have a state religion where everybody had to belong to the same thing. And that sometimes gets mixed up on the separation of church and state means taking all the religion uh, out of the government, every bit, like off our money. Um, right above in the House of Representatives, where I've worked for the last 24 years, the Speaker of the House has a chair, and right above that chair, uh, there's a saying that there that says, e pluribus unum out of many one, and another, that's actually on the ceiling, and the one behind the, the speaker says, uh, um, says uh, under God, basically. Um, so, you know, one nation under God, and that's, that's in the Capitol building. So God is not removed uh, from the public. It just means no state religion where we all have to follow uh, the same religion. Right. right. Well, in, with uh, equality in the United States, um, definitely uh, people have different beliefs. Uh, for the Turkish American community, I can say that uh, spiritual well-being is important. Yeah. Uh, that God is important. Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, and it plays a lot, uh, even in the secular families, such as I, such the family I come in come from, uh, where uh, religion has not played or uh, Islam has not paid, play, paid a very important part. My parents always say, "God bless" or "May God be with you," and they really, really mean it. So, um, also equality and justice for all uh, is uh, is important. Uh, in the pledge. And here, the Turkish American community is looking for more of a uh, more participation in the democratic process. Uh, we believe that equality is guaranteed uh, for those who work hard for it uh, by um, engaging the process. Uh, at this time, we're still in the learning process, but I think uh, soon uh, the most of us. Uh, are in the learning process, but uh, the, there is a part of our community that is reaching out to the rest of the community saying, uh, let's uh, be more active in American government uh, in, um, together in unity. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see the Turkish American community become, you know, more active. They're pretty active now, but even more so. Uh, and I just realized, I think I misspoke about the there are various slogans, some's on money, some's on here and there. The one behind the speaker says, uh, in God we trust. Um, that's, that's what it says up, up there. So, okay. um, I think it's know, on the right? money. I think it's yeah. on money too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but, um, so I say, with respect to U.S.-Turkish relations, what do you see as the um, opportunities and the challenges? Yeah, I think, you know, we do have some challenges. Obviously, the, the Russian missile uh, you know, defense program was one that, uh, uh, you know, our military community and members of Congress, too, uh, were quite upset about that. I, you know, we need to get beyond it. Uh, as you indicated before, Turkey is a very powerful country, a very important country and a very important part of the world. It has been a NATO ally and friend uh, and, and has sent uh, troops on missions with the U.S. and other allies. So, They've been a good partner uh, for the most part for years and years and years now. Um, but they're, they're I think that they're, we're going to hit to get beyond that, the Russian missile, uh, you know, program. Um, that's one where, you know, I personally think the Turkish leadership made the wrong decision, uh, but it's been made at this point, And I'm not sure that it's even possible to, to go back on that, although I would like to see that uh, reversed.
Yeah. I, I don't know if reversal uh, is uh, impossible, uh, but I do th believe that uh, air defense, such as through the provision of patriots, uh, has been a long discussion, which is uh, yeah. which has not been fruitful. Uh, I think the Turkish uh, people want an air defense, and for a long time, I preferred the Patriot uh, yeah. uh, missile. Um, definitely, I think there's this discussion to be conversation to be had there uh, for the long term. The um, uh, the Turkish forces have uh, led uh, international forces twice now in Afghanistan and open the doors to Somalia uh, for both the United States and Europe uh, to help that country stabilize and be productive. Um, and also been very act was very active in the Balkans, particularly in, the, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and of course before that, uh, um, Korean War, um, helping uh, South Korea uh, avoid uh, communism. Um, so, um, with respect to uh, uh, Russian uh, exertion of Russian power in the region, um, what we're seeing is a uh, multipolar world developing, where you have Russia and you have China, you have the United States, uh, perhaps kind of in unity or not with the European Union, which is looking for a purpose. Um, how would you? Uh, what would you say about the importance of NATO within this multipolar uh, development? Yeah, I think NATO is still a critical alliance. Um, I would encourage uh, both Turkey and my country, the United States, uh, to stay active and engaged and try to reform the organization from within. Um, you know, there are a lot of my constituents who have become over the years so fed up with NATO uh, the, and the UN for that matter, uh, that they just think we ought to pull out. I don't agree with that. Um, I do think that we shouldn't have uh, traditional um, human rights abusers like, uh, you know, Cuba and North Korea who end up on, on UN human rights committees, for example, and you've got some of the worst world's uh, human rights abusers that are making decisions um, for other countries across the globe. So, so I, my, in, in summary, I would say that uh, we ought to have the United States and Turkey working together because we have a lot more in common uh, than, than we do differences. You're, you're so right. And I think the strong, one of the strongest powers we have is the United States, well beyond our 700 uh, military bases in the world yeah. and our capacity in space is our soft power. Yeah. Uh, we have... People, for example, love blue jeans. It's simple, but it's, it, it is a lifestyle uh, that we're looking to, uh, to show that we have a com more common than we have differences. Um, we have a uh, pop culture of the United States. Um, and, and this is what I think makes the United States strong in other countries. It's what makes the United States strong and uh, credible and respectable in Turkey too. The, the, uh, not just the values, but how those values play out in lifestyles. Um, and the United States is a diverse group of people, huge, the most diverse. I always kind of uh, used to compare it to um, Star Trek, you know, that uh, the uh, spaceship was filled with all kinds of people. Uh, yeah. Turkey comes from that kind of a background too, has more than 30 ethnic groups that are now Turkish citizens. Right. Uh, so how can we, what, what are some ideas you might have to uh, project US soft power more effectively abroad? Uh, well, we, yeah, we do need to do a better job. Um, we also need to, uh, uh, when we provide aid to various countries, uh, you know, we ought to make sure that people understand where it came from. Um, I, I remember years ago uh, seeing a photo of, a, uh, of a, a man and he is with a bag of food. It's been one of the, uh, you know, some sort of grain is in there. And he's looking at his, it says uh, U.S. on there because it came from the United States. Uh, and there was a flag on there, on, you know, American flag on there. 
again, this was a cartoon. And he's looking at it and he said, he said, well, this is so thoughtful. The Americans, they've given us food and a flag to burn. You know? <laughs> so, and so too often, I, I think uh, we don't, we don't use that soft power. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, we're not changing enough hearts and minds. There's propaganda out there basically saying that the U S is just in it to, you know, make money for our businesses or they want to, we want them to knuckle under our points of view. No, that's not really what the United States is about at all. You know, yep. we think there should be some uh, some principles, you know, rule of law, um, you know, f f free and open markets, those kind of things that benefit all of us. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we think countries get to determine their own policy and we're there to help. And uh, so I think the United States does a lot more good across the globe than we get credit for, especially in these trying times. Right. It's kind of like a quiet giant sometimes. Yeah, uh, yeah that's true. And it, and it deserves so much more of the uh, uh, main stage. Um, uh, you know, and I, ref I reflect on U.S. presence in, in Turkey in this manner as well. Sometimes, though, Congressman Chabot, the uh, mixed messages are mixed. Um, the the overwhelming commonalities and overwhelming benefits of the partnership can be overshadowed. Um, at this time, I think we have more than 30 resolutions uh, in Congress and the Senate that are not so favorable to Turkey, negative on Turkey. And yeah. they are brought on by lobby groups that have a, another agenda as opposed to making Turkey the most perfect country in the world or in the region. There's something else maybe to make life difficult uh, for Turkey and the people of Turkey. Um, and then when I compare those numbers to anti, uh, to, uh, I would say, critical resolutions and laws regarding China or Russia or Saudi Arabia, um, they're less. And, and uh, so those, that can send a negative message to a wrong message actually to the people of Turkey. The people of Turkey want to be appreciated. They want to be in partnership, want to do good things together. Uh, but the, sometimes the message is contradictory. Um, how can we work on changing the frequency, tone, and negativity uh, of Congress's general sense about Turkey? Well, we've got to have open communications, and there, there were some... You know, a few incidences that happened that did hurt the relationship. Obviously, the uh, you know the the, the uh, all the violence that took place down outside the embassy some years ago. Um, you know, that was something that got out of hand, and there was some misinformation out there. But overall, the facts, you know, to some degree, spoke for themselves. There were cameras, there was footage, but it didn't show everything. And and uh, so that, that's something that had to be dealt with. And the other the other big issue, uh, you know, rem remains to be the, the Russian missiles um, and deciding to go there rather than purchase them from the United States. Um, and, and I think that's one of the biggest obstacles we still face. Um, and, uh, you know, but we, we're allies, you know, we should be on the same page. And so we need to work together to overcome those, those particular shortcomings. Right. Um, like again, on I think uh, Russian missiles. I don't think the conversation has ended. I think uh, more in the forefront of everyone's understanding is uh, why haven't we provided air missile defense to Turkey, who really needs it, uh, yeah. whereas we've easily provided it to other countries that don't need it. Uh, what comes to mind is Romania, for example, a recent yeah. acquisition. Um, the uh, Turkish American community can serve as a bridge builder. Uh, the Turkish American National Steering <coughs> Committee can serve as a voice of that bridge um, in these times. Um, this is why we are with Task TV uh, reaching out to uh, leaders as yourself um, to also to have dialogue with you, but also to seek your guidance. Uh, on how to make this uh, relationship strong. The Turkish caucus is a very important uh, player. 
uh, and we thank you for leading that with your three other colleagues. Um, the caucus can also serve as, serve as a bridge builder, a group that uh, brings uh, more information, not less, more information to decision makers so that there's informed decision making. Uh, the Azerbaijan caucus is important too. Uh, it might be uh, 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 productive for the Turkish and the Azerbaijan caucus leaders to come together these days and to, to discuss the uh, U.S. role in, in, the, in the caucuses. Uh, yeah. Definitely, this is considered, maybe incorrectly, the backyard of Russia, but that's just a Soviet concept. Soviet yeah. empire is over. And you know, we had the Soviet embassy on Wisconsin Avenue for years. And I always wondered uh, way back, you know, when the Soviet, um, uh, Soviet Union was going to dissolve, who was going to get that building? And it's Russia that got that building. Yeah. It wasn't Kazakhstan, it wasn't Azerbaijan or Armenia or Georgia. It was Russia that got that building. Everyone else was out there for themselves. The Soviet Union, in a way, was a program to uh, exploit the others, those other countries. Uh, yeah. for the benefit of Russia. So today, I don't think we can call the caucuses the backyard of Russia anymore unless we want to continue with the Soviet concept. Uh, and Armenia can definitely seek more independence from Russia. It has a military agreement with Russia. Um, and I think this is, through Turkey, an excellent opportunity for United States leadership in the region, uh, if not direct. Um, so is there a discussion about U.S. role uh, the U.S. role, no, there is a discussion definitely with respect to Afghanistan and to Iran, but what about with respect to the Caucasus? Uh, yeah, there is a discussion going on now. We're, we're getting into an area that, you know, a lot of members of Congress, unless they're on the Turkey Caucus or they're on the Foreign Affairs Committee or the Middle East Subcommittee, may not know a lot about it because it doesn't get huge amounts of press coverage back here in the United States. And so our constituents who we answer to don't necessarily know too much about it or care too much about it. So I think what I would recommend is that the you know, Turkish community take that on as an issue to try to educate their people, writing letters to the editor and, and you know, various other ways that one can, you know, social media, uh, and elevate that amongst the population. And then politicians, people like myself, We'll pay more attention to it because our our people will care more about it, uh, if if that makes sense. That makes total sense, um, and it, and these are important issues. All the issues on the on the uh, borders of Turkey are very important to Turkish Americans, and we believe that there are systems out there to resolve these issues uh, peacefully, productively, uh, for the longer term uh, interests of the entire region, um, bringing people together. Uh, is a uh, is key, and and maybe we should start that here in the United States, in bringing the, the stakeholders together, uh, Turkish Americans and other hyphenated Americans from the region. Um, Congressman Javit, tell us about what's going to happen. Where are we headed? Uh, um, elections are coming. COVID nineteen, and um, we are tired of quarantining ourselves. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we just want a normal life again. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you. And obviously, if the president of the United States can get it, anybody can get it. Right. Um, looks like he's going to be OK. He and the first lady, you know, we hope that things could still take a turn for the worse. But it's looking pretty good right right now. And we need to get beyond this pandemic. But we're not there yet. The virus is still out there in this country and other countries across the globe. So we still do need, to, you know, to take common sense measures to keep us and our families and our friends and associates safe, which, you know, basically means social distancing, washing hands, wearing a mask when, when like, you know, we don't have to have one on right now, but if we get together face to face, we got to put those masks on. Um, so, you know, I think the president in, in stressing the private sector uh, and, and kind of turning the regulatory restrictions, turn those off, I think we're going to have a, uh, a vaccine, a safe and effective vaccine a lot sooner than would normally be the case. I think way before this thing's been around for a year, uh, we're going to be treating uh, 
people that will cure them from the, from the disease. That's that's my understanding of what I'm uh, what I'm hearing up here. Well, I think I'm getting that vaccine to frontline population uh, um, densities is is critical. Uh, yeah. um, and also, the mental health of our children are very important. I'm going to, coming back to you as a, as as you're a teacher at heart. Uh, yeah. you know, we got to keep our children healthy. Thinking, um, in my county in Maryland, where I live, you know, we are starting sports programs. Yeah, and I can't see how they do it. But they do it because they want to get out of the house. I see kids playing sports with masks on. So, uh, but it's. We think it's healthy for them to be out yep. and out. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. We need to get the schools reopened safely. We need to get our businesses reopened safely uh, and get America moving again. You know, the, the COVID is going to be with us for a while. We've learned how to treat it and reduce the symptoms and reduce fatality rates. Um, they're not going to go down to zero overnight, but, you know, we can be heading in the right direction. Right. But at the same time, we need to save this economy Make sure that people are able to work and support themselves and most importantly, support their families. Yeah, the uh, assistance that the government has provided um, to small businesses has been very helpful. The Turkish American community is thankful for that. They have applied for the, uh, um, the protection, uh, pay paycheck protection, and they have uh, received uh, funding task uh, assisted in the process so they, they could uh, stay above the water and you know what makes this country very uh, 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 appealing to people who, who want to come here and live here is the economy plus its freedoms yep. so put, put that together it's a great place and and we can't let COVID we believe in the Turkish American community stop that the Turkish American community has gone through a lot of struggles. Our grandparents went through a lot of struggles, um, and we're used to struggling. Uh, but um, and we think we will overcome this, and the economy will be good. People will be uh, free, um, and we just are looking to leaders to sometimes give us that morale, so to yeah. speak. Uh, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I would encourage people to go to go out and you know, reclaim their lives, uh, but do it safely. You know, right. it, it, that's, that's the important thing. Social distancing, mask, washing hands. I know I've already said that and sound like a broken record, <laughs> no, but no, we no. ought to automatically no, no, no. do those things. Yeah. No, the Turkish American National Steering Committee has uh, contributed through its medical uh, professionals um, hundreds of thousands of masks uh, tremendous. In, in, nor in the Northeast and in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, and we have contributed tens of thousands of surgical suits. Uh, no, we're in this uh, safely uh, to stop the spread, and we're in this safely to get to win this, uh, uh, win over this, um, uh, get over this uh, uh, virus, uh, this disease. Uh, we look forward to that, and and I think there's a uh, we have glimmers of hope in the in the close horizon. Uh, uh, Congressman Chavez, what about your family? Tell us about that. Family's yeah, really important to us. Yeah, people people are doing pretty well. My my wife, we've been married uh, almost forty eight years now, oh, and uh, you know she's doing well. We did have a new addition to our family, a new dog, uh, just <laughs> last week. So our, our, our yeah, our our dog uh, Sparky unfortunately passed away of old age uh, last year. He was almost sixteen years old. A little white Bichon Frise. So we got a new little white Bichon Frise last week. This one's just a puppy. I can't yeah. wait till he's house trained and doesn't <laughs> bark at night. Um, yeah. But he's cute as the Dickens. Uh, so, but that's the pet department. Uh, our children are doing fine. Our daughter's up in uh, Watertown, New York. Our son's up in Chicago. Um, we've got uh, two grandchildren so far, and they're both doing great. A little grandson, a little granddaughter, and yeah. I couldn't be happier uh, uh, or prouder of, of them. So. Uh, you know, family's doing well, and I, I hope all, all your families, all those that are participating uh, here uh, today, I hope you're, you and your family and your loved Thank ones you. are all doing well as well. Thank you, sir. We've uh, come to coming to the conclusion of our program. Uh, like I said, family is very important to us, and we do everything to support uh, family um, in 
And if our family's good, but another family's not so good, we help them. And that's why we, we, we contributed, we distributed uh, food baskets, food boxes to 40,000 families in the New Jersey, New York region. Uh, family first is what we said. That's so, tremendous. That's, congratulations. And thank you so much for that. That's, uh, that's great to hear. Thank you. I, I thank all our uh, medical professionals and our small business owners for making the donations that made that happen. That's uh, wonderful. So we are taking ownership of our country, America, and, uh, and we want to be productive members. We want to integrate into the society and, um, and do our very best for today and for the future, and particularly all children of America. Well, well, thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Lydia. As always, as I mentioned before, she's a great advocate uh, for all things Turkey, and uh, we rely upon her knowledge and expertise uh, and honesty, really, uh, probably more than any other person in Washington that I've met, met with and dealt with over my 24-year history. And that helps Turkey, really. It's, it's right on. It does. put me in a position, yeah, to, to be able to help uh, both our countries. And I think, you know, when the United States is doing well, that's good for Turkey. When Turkey's doing well, that's good for the United States. And so we need to continue to work together. Excellent. Well said. Thank you, Congressman Chabot. I thank, thank you. I thank your team, Mackenzie. I thank our uh, our community members who are uh, activists in uh, making our hear our voice heard, such as Lydia. And I, I thank my team for uh, the IT and technical team for putting this together. This program will be shown widely, and like I said, we've reached two million view viewers. And uh, we always welcome constructive uh, criticism, uh, as well as. Uh, words of uh, encouragement uh, from our viewers and from our participants. We thank you again, sir. You be well. God bless you and your family and America. Thank you. God bless everyone on here and your families as well. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.